Good morning, and thank you again for joining us. We are going to continue our study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, today we're going to try to cover two chapters, chapter 5 and chapter 6. Uh, so we're going to start off in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. Um, here we're going to talk about immorality and its effects on the church. So we're going to start out, we'll read 1 Corinthians 5. And we'll read verses 1 through 8. So 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up, and not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has, done, who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here Paul is, is concerned with the morality of the church. And as we remember from earlier classes, Corinth, was kind of known for its lewdness and its debauchery, but a new morality was was been brought to them through Jesus Christ. The morality of, of chastity and sobriety and honesty and truthfulness and kindness. Yet they were practicing and accepting something that, that as Paul put, even the Gentiles didn't speak of it at that time. You know, and verse 5 brings up a really interesting point about of, uh, of discussion about all this and when he says deliver such a one to Satan and there's been a lot of discussion about what was meant by that that statement's known as the, uh, the apostolic sentence um, but its full meaning was, was not clear and I, I've researched a few commentaries and there's varying opinions but there's not a real clear statement on what the apostolic sentence was um, popular thought was that the sinful man was delivered to Satan so that he could suffer physical afflictions that would bring him to repentance um, and turn out for the good of his soul so that he may be saved. Um, and as Paul mentioned, they weren't even concerned about losing this guy. They were just letting it go. Um, and, and, you know, we know that, uh, that there's no power like that remaining in the church. That was reserved for the apostles to deliver someone to Satan to, to cause that physical affliction and to harm them in a way to bring them back to repentance. Um, but this was the same power that, that was put upon Ananias and Sapphira. And, you know, and they were struck dead when they, uh, you know, when they lied about how much they had received from the sale of their house. And then Elimus the sorcerer was struck blind. Uh, Apostles alone were entrusted with that. And here, Paul's talking about the, the, the Corinthians weren't even, really, weren't even really concerned about that. And Paul moves on and he's, he's going to talk about purging out the, the old leaven because we are a new, we are unleavened. And that's kind of the point we need to take from that passage is that we can't allow sin to go unnoticed or untalked about in in church uh, in the congregation in the, in our in our church community now I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect people we're going to have sin um, but it's that continuance of, of sin that that we can't allow to go undealt with um, in ourselves in our brothers and sisters um, in our elders in our deacons in our minister in, in any part of the church we can't let that sin go undealt with. We need to confront it 
if it becomes an issue, um, and, and we need to deal with it and, and try to help the person out, and so that, as Paul put it, we're not worried, that we don't have to worry about losing him. We need to be so concerned of all of us being lost. That, that we are looking out for each other, you know, that we are taking care of each other in, in, in our lives. And, and the same for our personal lives, you know. We can't let sin rule over us. We have to have that repentant heart and that, that forgiving heart to ask God to forgive us and to forgive our brothers and sisters when we've been wrong. And that's kind of what Paul's talking about here. And he's going to go on and finish out the chapter. And let's read verses 9 through 12. He's talking about judging immorality. And he, and he, he writes, I wrote to you in my, in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world. Or with the covetous the, or extortioners or idolaters. Since then you would need to, to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reveler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. For what, I, what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside God judges. Therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. So Paul gives an interesting take here. He's saying, you know... I'm not telling you not to hang out with immoral people and be around immoral people and, and idolaters and, and sinners and stuff like that that are not inside the church. He said, but I, you need to deal with, with those that you call a brother, right? Because if we just didn't hang out with anybody that was immoral or anybody that was sinning or, or an idolater or anything like that, well, we'd all be sitting home alone? I mean, we would never grow the church. We would never grow God's people. So we need to not put those people away that are outside of, of Christ. We need to more or less run to them to bring them to us. But when we're dealing with somebody inside the church, inside the brotherhood, who is a member of Christ's body, those people we need to deal with, those are the ones that we judge. See, and Paul's talking about that. We're not here to judge the world. That's God's job. We're not God. That's God's job to judge the world. Our job is to bring them to repentance, to bring them to Christ, to bring them to God. But we are, we are called, right here in 1 Corinthians, we are called to judge those that are called a brother. To tell them, what you're doing is wrong, what you're doing is against God's word. And that's, that's an important part of that, that we need to have, is, is to deal with the problems inside the church, inside the church. And to love those outside, to bring them closer to Christ, to bring them inside. And then let's move on. Let's cover chapter 6. In chapter 6, the main topic is do not sue the brethren. So let's read, we'll read chapter 6 and we'll read verses 1 through 11. And it says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Or if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are the least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame, it is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, 
and you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And what I like about this passage here is, I mean, Paul's basically saying, are you kidding me? You're going to take small matters to those that are, that are not worthy, to the unrighteous, and let the world judge you? Keep your stuff in-house. Let God judge you. Let the book judge you. Let Christ's words judge you. Don't go outside and let the world judge you. Keep it inside. And that's where we come back to the, the common thing that we've had all year and through this class is the unity of the church. Be united together. Present a united front outside and be united together inside. We all read the same thing. We all speak the same thing. We all believe the same thing. You can't let little matters tear you apart. You can't let little matters go and, and fill out to the outside. And don't let the world judge what's going on inside the church. Don't let the world judge you on things that Christ speaks about because as he put it, these people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. He says it in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And you're taking your problems to the unrighteous. You're taking your problems out to the world. Keep your stuff in-house. Let us deal with it together as a family and be united. That way when we're out in the world and we're out trying to, to do as we're called to do and make disciples and spread the gospel of Christ, we're united in what we're doing. And that brings us closer together. Unity brings us closer together. And it's like Walt talked about two weeks ago in class when he was talking about John 3.16 and he said, that Micah had preached on that and he brought up a good point that God showed us what love was. That he gave his only son for us. That we may have forgiveness in him. And we have to have that forgiveness with our brothers and sisters. And forgiveness brings about true unity. And that's what Paul's talking about here is we need to deal with ourselves inside the church and not let the world judge us. Not let the world tell us what's right and wrong. And not bring our problems to the world. We know what the Word of God says. And let's deal with the Word of God. And he's going to finish up here in chapter 6. And he's going to talk about glorifying God in body and spirit. So let's read chapter 6. We'll read verses 12 through verses 20. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise, up, raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. <clears throat> but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Now the overall theme of the last two chapters is Paul's been talking about immorality. And he's been talking about sexual immorality that had entered the church of Corinth. And their unwillingness to deal with it. And to not be concerned about what's going on and about losing this, this member. And he's talking about you're not yours anymore. See, when we made that commitment to, to Christ and we made that commitment to God and we were baptized, we were baptized into Christ. We were, we were baptized into his body. We are members of the body of Christ. And our bodies aren't ours to just do with willy-nilly what we want to anymore. And as, he, as he puts it, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. And that's what he's talking about. God gave us a beautiful thing in, in an intimate relationship with our spouse. He gave us that to, to help curb the, the immorality that's, that's been a problem from 
in the beginning, really. But we have a bigger calling. We are members of Christ now. And we need to protect our bodies, what we do with them, and how we do it, and who. We need to protect all that because we are God's holy temple. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, and we need to protect that with all that we have. And it's, it's it can be an uncomfortable to, uh, topic to, to talk about in, in, in a setting at, at a church. I mean, you don't go to church to talk about stuff like this, but... The problem is, is not dealing with it in the church has led to the problems that we have outside the church. And, you know, we're, we're in a, we're in a, uh, in a time now where you can be whatever you want to be and the world tells you it's okay. And as I've said before, if it goes against the word of God, you're wrong. We live in a time where Nobody fights for a marriage anymore. It's easy to get a divorce. People have had two or three. We're so far away from what God intended us to do. We're so far away from what God wants from us. And it, it all, it's it, it summed up great in these two chapters. We're not dealing with the sexual immorality that's, that's in the church. We're not dealing with the sexual immorality that's that's in the world. We're ignoring it. We're saying, well, it's you know, it's okay. We're going to embrace what's going on, and we're letting the world be our judge. We're letting the world say that that everything's okay. But, but God's word is contrary to that. God's word says that it's not okay, and that's what we need to go back to. And, and Paul uses a great illustration here that. Our body is not our body. We were bought with a price. We were bought with the blood of God's only son. And, and as he puts here, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. And that's where we need to focus our time is we are not our own. We are members of Christ's body. We are God's children. And we need to unify together in the church, combat all immorality, sexual immorality, all immorality that's going on. But we've got to combat it in the church first, and we have to be united in our belief and in, in what the Word of God says, in what we're bringing, what message we're bringing to the world so that the world is not changing us. We are changing the world. And that's where we're going to leave off um, next week. Hopefully, we'll be together in class. Um, it's going to be Valentine's, which chapter 7 is a fitting chapter for that as it talks about marriage. So uh, I'll be leading in with marriage, uh, hopefully Sunday morning in class. And then you know how Micah is. He'll do that old cliche thing on Valentine's Day and preach a sermon on love and marriage as well. Um, that's my bet anyway. But thank you guys for watching. And... Uh, I hope to see you all in class next week. Have a great day.